All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I am uh, now going to try to finish off Chapter 6 here. Um, I am doing this while uh, my laptop is trying to upload the first chap the first part of the chapter, so Chapter 1 and 6 for the uh, Interpretations Higher Level Class, Chapter 6, Section 1 and 2. I am now moving on to Section 3. Uh, and these last few sections are actually pretty simple. It's... Uh, very similar to what we were, what we've been doing so far, um, except what we've been doing so far is with quadratic regressions. Everything that I said before applies to all possible regressions, including cubic regressions and uh, power regressions, logarithmic regressions, and so on and so forth. We're actually going to be doing all of that here today. <clears throat> all right, but uh, why don't we actually start by doing it this way, um, and we're going to move on to section three. Uh, so I'm on page 261, and uh, I'm going to try to do, let's do a tough one, number four. So it says, sketch the graphs for the following functions, write down the coordinates of points where the graphs intersect the axes, and any local maximum and minimum points. All right, so number four uh, says that f of x is going to equal uh, 3 times x plus 2 cubed minus four. All right, now, uh, what does this actually mean? Well, we're gonna start with the standard um, cubic polynomial, which if you want, it looks exactly like uh, this. This is the uh, standard um, spline, if you will. It moves kind of like that. Yes, that's right. My, my daughter's saying Dada book. Uh, but as you can see, this one's actually going to be shifted to the left two units. It's going to be shifted down four units. And it's going to have a vertical stretch factor of three. So if I were to actually plot both of these, I mean, huh, why not here? So let's actually uh, increase the, um, the range on that a little bit. How about seven, negative seven to positive seven. And let's plot this one. So three x plus two cubed minus 4 to positive 7 uh, and I have to do the show all right so this was the original spline and this one is shifted over four unit uh, shifted over two units shifted down four units and uh, it's got a vertical stretch factor of three now it's a uh, it actually scaled out quite a lot here which uh, is rather unfortunate. Let me actually uh, zoom in on that a little bit. So let me set the plot range here to negative uh, seven to positive seven for the x-axis. And why don't we actually, uh, you know, go like negative 20 to positive 20 for the y-axis. There we go. So this is the original spline right here. We shifted to the left two units. We went down four units. And it's a little bit thinner. It's actually stretched a little bit more, too. So that's just another idea behind, uh, you know, transformation of graph and stuff. All right. Now, this is the actual curve. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, where does it intersect the different axes here? Well, it seems to intersect right here, and it seems to intersect right here. Uh, why don't we actually find out what that is? Uh, let's do the y-intercept first. That's where x is equal to 0. Looks like it intercepts uh, at 20. So my uh, y-intercept here is 0, 20. Cool. And uh, what about the x-intercept? Well, remember, that's where I have to solve it. And you'll be doing a... Um, you'll, you'll have to graph it. You'll have to calculate your 0, as we've been saying before. Me, I've got Mathematica, so I don't need to do all that stuff. I'm just going to solve for when does, uh, what's the x value when uh, the f of x value is equal to 0. Uh, oh, that's because I, I have to clear the x value. Yeah, silly. Okay, so I have three different answers. Um, this one is an imaginary number, uh, which doesn't appear here. This one is also an imaginary number which does not appear here. Um, maybe one day we'll go into the complex plane, but for now, uh, if you have a little I right there, it means uh, this doesn't actually exist in the traditional Cartesian plane. 
but we do have one real solution here, which is negative 0.899. So my uh, x intercept here is negative 0.8994 and a y value of zero. Cool. Now, are there any local maximum or minimum points? Well, it's kind of hard to say. Um, why don't we zoom in on this a little bit? You know, so why don't we zoom in? Let's go uh, negative three to uh, negative two. Let's see what that looks like. Ooh, too too much, too close, too close. Uh, well, what do we we got to do like negative six to uh, negative two, I guess. Ugh, that's ugly. Hmm. How about we go to zero here? All right. So now we've zoomed in a little bit here. And it looks like there's a little bit of a a little bit of a thing going on here. There might be a, a little bit of a stretch factor. It's it's kind of hard to say. Um, you know what I mean? So why don't we actually give ourselves a, a little bit of a I want to actually see the uh, x-axis here. Ooh, too much here. I'm, I'm actually messing with the window quite a lot. Okay, so <clears throat> what if we wanted to find, uh, looks like I could get a little bit of a maximum here because it might, it might have a little bit of a curve right here. And uh, it's really hard to see it. You know what I mean? I mean, look at this. It's, uh, it, it could be up, it could have a little maximum here. It could have a little minimum here. But uh, why don't we actually see what we see? So I'm going to do a find a maximum here. And uh, why don't we start this at negative 3? Um, and I'll plug in f of x here. And we'll have an x here and a negative 3 here. Oh, it looks like we don't have uh, a maximum here. So that's cool. Um, how about we find a, find a minimum? I'm pretty sure we won't find a minimum either. Failed to converge. Yep. So uh, we don't have a minimum here or a maximum, start or, or local maximum or local minimum right here. So uh, yeah. So the answer to this one is we don't actually have a maximum or a minimum here. So that's the answer to uh, number four. Cool. And for some reason, my kid is messing with my other kid here. Okay. So um, that was too easy. Why don't we do one that's a little bit tougher? Let's do. Uh, 261 number five so uh, this one if I were to actually plot it I would actually get uh, 3x x minus 4 so this is page 261 number five and uh, why don't we actually plot this from uh, I don't know let's try negative 6 to 2 I guess let's see what that oh yeah that's that's not good let's change that to from negative five to positive five. All right, so that looks a little bit better. I could even shore that up a bit more. How about negative three to positive five? That looks good. Um, I could do that even better. How about negative two? Oh yeah, that looks good. Now I have my sketch done right here, uh, and uh, here we do have some a local maximum and a local minimum right here. Okay, so let's run through this one really quick <clears throat> first just like before I am going to define it like that uh, all right what's the y-intercept it would be zero zero uh, right what's the x-intercept well I got to do this And it looks like we have three of them. Negative one, zero, and four. So uh, that would be, those would be my x-intercepts there. So yep, and four, zero, nice. Okay, how about some local maximums and minimums? So why don't we actually find the first maximum, which is right here. Uh, find a local maximum here for f of x. 
And why don't we run that from x to negative? We'll start at uh, we'll start at negative one here and see what's the first maximum we find. All right, so our first maximum here has a height of 3.38 and an x value of negative whatever. So uh, local max is a negative 0 0.5283.5. Okay, and uh, why don't we find this minimum right here? So find minimum, and you'll be doing this off of your TI-84s, obviously. And why don't we start this one at uh, 2? Okay. Uh, the line search decreased the step size to within the tolerance. Okay, it's fine. Okay, so it's approximating it here, but this is absolutely... Is this does this does check out? This is pretty close to the minimum right here, so it looks like our uh, local minimum is going to be two point five two eight and a negative thirty nine point three eight four. All right, so that would be uh, that would be the answer to number five. Pretty easy. All right, now since this is a higher level class, why don't we actually do a really tough problem here? I'm going to be doing uh, 262, and uh, number 11 looks pretty juicy. Why don't we do that one, okay? So, 262 number 11 says, the maximum monthly temperature in a certain city during the course of one year from January to December can be modeled by the equation blank, uh, where... Let's actually put that up here, 0 0.162. Uh, it looks like T is defined, so why don't we clear T out. Uh, T cubed minus 3.36 T squared plus 18.2 T plus 1.74. And since T is in months here, we can go from 0 to... Uh, Oh, it starts at 1, and it goes to 12. What is going on here? Oh, it's because I had a comma here. That's silly. There we go. Okay, so this would actually be uh, the curve that uh, this problem is going to present, where the Y value is your temperature, and your... Um, X value here represents your month, so 1 all the way to 12, where 1 corresponds to January. Find the maximum temperature in April. Okay, well, it, uh, it, it sounds like I have to say, all right, January, February, March, April. So the maximum temperature in April seems, uh, so I have to actually find out when, when T is between 4 and 5. That would be the... <clears throat> That would be the month of April. So January, February, March, April. So what's the maximum temperature in April? Well, uh, first let's make sure that uh, our, our maximum is actually uh, not in April. So what's the total maximum temperature right here? Uh, T, why don't we start this at two? Yep, as I suspected. So the month, the, the maximum of the entire year is at 3.69. After this, it's going down. So that means that uh, the temp, the maximum temperature in April is uh, going to have to be uh, when T is exactly equal to 4. Because the maximum actually appears uh, mid-March. And it's just getting colder and colder and colder and colder. So actually, the answer to uh, 11A is... Uh, this. So first let me uh, define my F value here so that way I can actually work with it. And let's actually plug in F exactly equal to 4, which corresponds to April the 1st. The maximum temperature in April is 31.148. So you got to read that very carefully. Uh, 11A says find the maximum temperature in April, which means I'm only looking uh, for the month of April, I'm only looking for a maximum 
temperature between the T values of four is less than, I, I thought this was latex for a second, four is less than or equal to that is less than five. So that means that um, uh, uh, when T is equal to four, that represents April the first. And as long as T does not equal five, then I'm within the month of April because five would represent uh, March, January, February, March, April, May. Actually, five would represent May. So noticing that the actual yearly maximum happens in March, that would mean since I'm going down, 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 I have to actually find out that the maximum temperature in April is going to be when uh, you plug in the exact value of four because that represents April the 1st or April Fool's Day. All right, so uh, 11B, find the month during which the greatest and lowest maximum temperatures occur. Uh, okay, so find the month during which the greatest and uh, lowest maximum temperatures occur. Well, we actually found the first one. The greatest maximum temperature occurs in March. Uh, what's the least maximum temperature here? Well, I have to find out what this minimum here is. It looks like it's going to be about 10, but let's actually uh, be double sure here. So find our minimum here of uh, this and we're going to start this one at, looks like 9 is pretty good. Yep, yep as I thought, the, the lowest maximum occurs in uh, October. Um, so there you go. So March and October, that's the answer to letter B. Uh, okay, C, find the mean of the two temperatures in part B. The mean of the two temperatures in part B, uh, well, huh, okay, that's really weird, <laughs> um, okay, so I actually need to take the mean of these two temperatures then. So this is the temperature that occurs in March, and this is the temperature that occurs in October. What's the average of these two? Okay, I actually have the, the way of doing that here. I'm gonna just copy and paste this number. And let's copy and paste this number. And I'm actually gonna find the average of the two. To find the average, of course, you can just add these two numbers together and divide by two. Me, I'm lazy. I just I have a command that'll do it for me. So the average of the two temperatures is 20.5. Cool. Um, so that's letter C. Uh, let's see. State the month whose maximum temperature is approximately equal to the average you found in part C. Uh, okay. That's easy enough. All I need to do is uh, solve when does this equation equal this temperature. You know, what's the T value for uh, that will make this whole function equal to 20.5? So looking at the, the actual graph, it looks like I have a couple. I have one right about here in January, maybe, when it's 20.5. And then there's another time that it happens here uh, right around July. So I should get actually two answers here. Uh, but let's solve. So uh, you, you all will actually just, um, you'll have to actually, do this a little bit cleverly with your TI-84s. Me, I'm super easy and, you know, stuff. So it's pretty easy to actually do this on Mathematica here. So I'm going to solve for T by, uh, say, what, what X values will actually make me get a Y value of that? And I should get, um, well, we're only counting it from 1 to 12 here. Uh, this one is actually occurring after December. So we're actually not counting this one. We have two values here. So uh, it looks like January and uh, January, February, March, April, May, June. So January and June. That would be the, uh, the months, the two months that you actually would find the average temperatures here. All right. Comment on your findings. Uh, well, it, yeah, I, I guess that, that looks cool, I suppose. Um, it, if you're saying that the average temperature occurs in, uh, January, 
that uh, that seems kind of odd. I would imagine that it would be really, really cold in January. I, I mean, maybe this is like a weird place in the world because I would imagine that uh, you would get a minimum really close to uh, January and February. Like this should be happening over here, uh, not the other way around. So, I mean, this just seems a little bizarre to me. Like it's shifted a little too much to the uh, to the wrong way for me. Like this, this should be backwards, first of all. This should be reflected the other way and the minimum should happen around here, at least for us. Now, uh, since the, the hottest part of the year is like in January and stuff, you know, I might actually think that the temperature here is uh it, this is actually looking a lot like a temperature that's going on in um the southern hemisphere if i had to comment on this one i would say that the city here might be in south america or uh really sub-saharan africa here so um <laughs> it, it, it's definitely lower in the equator here where it's actually hot for our winter and uh cold for our summer if you will uh, that would be my commentary on this particular situation. Okay, uh, moving on here. Uh, why don't we go back to something a bit easier. Uh, and let's actually try to model some really cool... Uh, let's model some really cool data here. So, um, why don't we do 266 number 4. That looks pretty good. So it says, using technology, plot these points and find the best fit to model this data. All right, so uh, just like before, why don't we actually do all the X values here? Okay. And uh, let's do all the Y values. So we got 63, 82, 104, uh, 91, 83, 68, 52, 41, 56, and 71. Whoa, where'd that K come from? That's supposed to be a comma. And L will equal transpose L. Let's make sure I didn't miss any. Oh, what do you know? I missed one. <laughs> 63, 82, 104, 91, 83, 68, 52, 41. There's supposed to be a 35 right here. Okay, and a 45. Oh, I'm too tired, y'all. All right, so that looks good. Got all my X and Y values together. Let's uh, pl list plot that. Uh huh. Yeah, okay, so it definitely looks like we want to do some type of cubic uh, fit here. All right. So you all will actually do a cubic regression. That's going to be a uh, stat test cubic regression me i have a uh, mathematica here so i'm actually going to do it this way how about we do a uh times uh x minus b this gives me a bit of horizontal shift a little bit of a uh, vertical shift here and a little bit of a stretch factor here okay declare my constants and i got my x value i want the uh normal of this particular thingy here. And it tells me that you get this equation right here. Why don't we plot that <clears throat> next to our thing and let's graph this from uh, one to 12. Yeah, that, that doesn't look right. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so what happened here? Okay, well, it doesn't seem to like that. Why don't I do it the uh, good old-fashioned way here? Uh, now, you won't have this problem for, uh, for all of you, but it, it looks like um, Mathematica thinks that this needs something a bit more complicated than what I wrote. So why don't we do C times X and then plus D? So I'm, I'm actually going to be doing the general, the general uh, equation here. Uh, instead of the simplified version. I, I think that's probably what I need to do. So we're going to do this. Ah, that looks a lot better. So I needed to use the uh, general form, not the uh, simplified, you know, lefty-right-shifty stuff that we were doing. And uh, 
let's see. This has a lot of decimals in it, so why don't we actually reduce this to something manageable? <clears throat> something a bit more manageable all right and of course we want to actually find out what the r squared value is so why don't we declare our uh, equation here and let's do r of l our r squared value is 0.947 so it's a pretty good fit honestly that's that's really not bad so justify your choice of a best best fit function my r squared value is 0.947 that's really close to one, which means this is really, really strong. And uh, the appropriateness of this model, well, uh, it definitely seems to peak right about here and it seems to trough right about here. So yeah, that would work just fine. Okay, I know it seems like I'm doing a whole lot of stuff out of Mathematica here instead of actually facing you with the uh, tri erase board, but that's because a lot of this second part of the chapter six is largely dealing with how do you use your calculator and since I don't have a TI-84, I hate them, uh, you all are going to be stuck using them. Me, I have Mathematica here, so I'm going to be doing it like that. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let's see here. We're going to be doing a bit of power regression. Um, what's a good problem here? Yeah, how about we do uh, number five? That looks pretty good. So Viola is conducting an experiment to demonstrate the relation between the radius and the volume of a sphere. She gathered the following data. All right, so uh, let's plug in our X values here. Whoa. Okay, and uh, our Y values are this, which is the volume of the uh, sphere. And L will equal the transpose of L. Uh, I am too tired here. 113, 268. Oh, I'm missing one. 524. Is that all? Whew. Okay. That took a long time, y'all. All right. List plot L. Let's actually see what it looks like. Okay. Now, uh, this one definitely looks like a parabola of some kind. But it's shooting really, it's actually exploding upwards. It's going into the thousands before we even got to eight. So this tells me that uh, um, a quadratic uh, thing that looks like this probably isn't our, our best bet. So in this section, we're actually going to be needing to do a type of power regression. What does it mean to have a power regression? Well, uh, it's in your calculator, but briefly, it's going to look a lot like uh, this. Okay, where um, uh, A and N are both, uh, like th this is the, the real big one. This is going to give us a stretch factor, and this one's going to give us um, some really high or low level degree polynomial. So a power regression, we're going to get an equation that looks a lot like that. So why don't we actually do that here? Uh, you all will just go to stat test power regression. Me, like I've been saying this entire time, I don't have the luxury of that. I'm actually going to use Mathematica. And uh, once again, I need to clear out my X value here. And uh, I'm going to raise this one to the B power. I think those are the only ones that they want me to use. Let's see if that works. Okay, and uh, I got this thing right here. Let's actually pull out the uh, normal of that. Cool. Uh, so here my degree is actually like 2.99. Uh, so it's not quite a cubic uh, polynomial here. Uh, but let's see what that looks like here. So let's plot that. We're going to copy and paste that there. And this is x from 1 to 8. All right. Hey, it looks like it, it fits more or less right on. Um, and that's cool. So why don't we actually reduce some of the decimals here because... You know, that's like setting my float to something manageable here. And uh, let's calculate our R squared value now. So I'm going to declare my uh, function here. And what's R of L? My R squared value is 
none, 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 five. So pretty much one at this point. It's it's almost perfectly on it. So this is my uh, my power function here, and uh, how does this actually compare for the volume of a sphere of radius ten? That would be uh, letter F. So if I plug in a value of ten, I'm going to get this. What is the actual volume of a sphere with a radius of exactly 10? Well, I have to do 4 thirds um, pi times uh, the radius cubed. Yep, pretty close. 4188 to 4175. That, that's really, really close. Uh, the error is incredibly small at that range. Um, anyway, that's how you do a power regression. It's pretty easy. Uh, one more time, in order for you to do this, you're going to plot your data in your TI-84s. And all you got to do is go to stat uh, test, I believe, and then uh, power regression. That's what it's going to do. And it'll report an R-squared value of pretty much close to 1. I think on your calculators, it'll exactly equal 1. So pretty easy stuff. Okay, so um, we're just going to move on to the very last section of Chapter 6 since we're uh, making such good time here. <clears throat> so uh, this one is called inverse variation. It's just the power regression here. Again, it's only this time we're, we're actually allowing uh, negative powers at this point. So this would be an example of an inverse variation function. It's just the power of regression. It's not hard at all. Um, here's an example uh, from the book 3A, which says sketch the graph of the following functions between the domains and uh, determine the range. Well x is not allowed to actually ever equal zero here and so the actual range would be negative infinity to zero and then uh, zero to positive infinity but we're not including the zero in the middle uh, obviously because this approach is an asymptote uh, of like y equals zero this way and y equals zero this way um, basically a, a, a common graph here that we're working with is what is the value of one over x uh, and it's going to look like that, where it approaches an asymptote at uh, 0 and 0. So nothing, nothing to see there. Pretty easy. Why don't we actually do a power regression on a typical problem here? So uh, let's do 277 number 5. So here, Timothy's doing a thing with his light uh, receiver or whatever. I'll leave you to, to actually read it. But um, this is the actual uh, data here. So I got 10, 15... 20, uh, 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45. Our y values are 32, 32, 14, 34, 805, 513, 353, 259, 201, and 159. And uh, L will equal the uh, transpose of L. Yep, everything seems to check out. Let's actually look at what that looks like here. All right. So clearly something that looks a lot like this would be really good. And for that, you're going to want to go onto your TI-84s and do a power regression. Remember, you do that by going to uh, stat test uh, power regression, just like we did earlier. Um, now, I don't have a TI-84, so I'm actually going to be doing this the really cool way which is with Mathematica. So I'm actually going to see what's the nonlinear model fit. And uh, looks like all I got to do is similar to what I was doing before. So A and B, X, cool. That, that looks pretty good, I guess. No horizontal shift or anything crazy like that. So I'll take the normal of that. Let's see what we actually get. All right, that's, that's not bad. Let's actually... Um, plot that thing from x 10 to 45 aha yeah that, that ooh, wow that, that looks really really spot on you know what I'm saying uh, we got a ton of decimals though so why don't we actually clean that up a little bit here and uh, let me do that again yeah okay so this is x to the negative 2.0077 power. Um, we're allowed to have decimal powers here. It's totally fine here. And our stretch factor here is 329,000. It's huge. 
but it seems to fit the data pretty nicely. Um, what does our R squared value look like when we actually do it? So I'm going to declare my F value here, and let's actually run our R squared. Ah, R squared is equal to point nine 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 or one. So it's really really good. Uh, the answer to the question is, uh, yeah, so we want to comment on the coefficient of determination. It's perfect here. Uh, sketch the model to estimate the light intensity if the light source moves to 50 centimeters from the receiver. All right, so I would just do F of 50. So the answer is going to be 127.711. Uh, Pretty cool. And, you know, one nice thing about it is if I just keep uh, punching in this value, I'm actually going to be approaching some type of uh, asymptote here. Now, uh, this would be how you would do the... Um, this would be how you would do it on your TI-84. And this one actually has no vertical shift. Uh, but what if I wanted to actually include a little bit of vertical shift here? I wonder what would happen. Let's, let's see what happens when I include a little bit of vertical shift. Well, I didn't declare the D, though. doesn't like that. Um, nothing seems to happen here. So, 10 is not a valid variable. I wonder what that... Oh, uh, I have to clear the X out. Doggone it. Clear the X value. There we go. So, um, failed to converge to the requested accuracy or position within... a. All right, so this is just, you know, another way to actually represent the same piece of data here. Uh, okay, so this one actually has some type of vertical shift but it looks really high for some reason um all right let, let's see what that looks like here Ugh, ugly so this one we actually don't want to allow any vertical shift at all <laughs> eh, it's all good and fun all right but the, the, this one's totally fine uh from before so <laughs> just ignore me I, i'm just like a curious cat you know you want to see what actually uh what this actually looks like. Um, all right, so this would be the answer here for uh, what is the uh, F value of 50? All good and all fine, no big deal. All right, so uh, that wraps it up for chapter six for the uh, application and interpretation higher level class. And that pretty much catches you up to where we were before this whole uh, lockdown thing started um why don't you guys go ahead and get started you can practice some uh fun chapter review sections or something like that i'm not assigning any homework obviously as i said in the previous video and uh you know this is sort of optional reading right now you all deserve a, a good break so if you don't want to listen to this video or whatever right now you don't have to in fact you don't really have to ever this is just a review of recent material just to keep things fresh. We're not going over any new material until uh, school comes back in. Either it's going to be cyber or it's going to be physically in person. Um, you know, we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, I definitely find doing this from home to be incredibly stressful because I have to also care for my uh, children. Uh, but I'm willing to do it for all of you because... I care. I want you guys to do really, really well. So anyway, I hope that this video finds you very, uh, you know, uh, safe and uh, at home and doing what you're supposed to be doing to stay totally um, healthy. And uh, you guys uh, take care and look for my next video. Bye bye. Oh yeah, uh, I should also say um, I am going to have another video up shortly about um, the statistics project. That one's going to be for everybody, of course. And, uh, you know, just to kind of review, like, this is what I expect you to be doing. So just because we're on a break uh, and maybe we're going to be doing some type of uh, remote access learning, that's not confirmed yet, of course. Your statistics project is still out there. It doesn't mean it's nullified and it's going away. You don't have to do it. You still got to do it. So gather your data and all that. Um, I'm going to have a full video on how to do that uh, coming up here shortly just to get everybody on the same page. But for now, I have to try to catch up all my classes. Then I'll come back and do the video on the stats project. So once again, you all take care and uh, you stay safe. Wash your hands a lot. 
social distancing, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.